We left off the last two weeks discussing uh, Abraham from the perspective of Genesis 18, 19. Why don't we pick up there? Genesis 18, 19, for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring upon or bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. King James is a little different. For I know him that he will command his children and his household so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And so that's where we've been the last two weeks in dealing with this concept of why did God choose Abraham? Now the reason we decided to go back and look at Abraham again on Wednesday nights is periodically I feel like I have to go back and study Abraham and I feel like, well, if I do, Probably we do. Many years ago, uh, I heard the pioneer of the largest church in the world, Dr. Paul Yonggi Cho, say that we have to go back periodically and study Abraham. In fact, I don't know that I've ever been anywhere and heard Dr. Paul Yonggi Cho teach without him going to Abraham. And the reason is because he is the father of it all. So, Let's uh, review some verses out of chapter 12. Then we're going to go to new ground in chapter 13, Genesis 12. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And by the way, let me just hit some highlights here. In order for Abraham to take action here, we would say it this way. Abraham heard God, Abraham believed God, and Abraham obeyed God. And I know there are people who would say, well, it just cannot be that simple. Well, it, it, it really has been in my life. I really could not count the times. In fact, I wish the Lord would speak more often than he does. You know, it would be really great if the Lord said, buy this tomorrow and sell that, you know, a week from Friday. I mean, I would just love it. But I mean, I don't know how many times in my life the Lord has led me to give some money or the Lord has led me to buy or to sell. I mean, oh my gosh. And the one thing I know about the Holy Spirit of God, he never leads us into the ditch. Amen. And so the main hearing that we do, though, in our lives is not in prayer from the Holy Spirit. The main hearing we do in our lives is what you're doing right here this evening. We hear from the Word of God. And so if we're going to get results like Abraham got results, well, maybe we're going to have to hear the Word and believe the Word and then obey the Word if we want the results. And the other thing is that this blessing that God pronounced over him was a double-sided blessing. He said, I will bless you. And he says, and you will be a blessing. And the problem, quite frankly, is a lot of people are interested in being blessed, but they're not that interested in being a blessing. And I think that this sabotages their results. Um, we're far enough along, Sue and I are far enough along in this now, that a lot of this is just second nature. And so, for example, when Pastor Joshua Akali of Mombasa, Kenya, contacted me that he had had this wreck with his last vehicle, which we did not help him with that one, uh, he had saved up and he had bought that one, and then it got totaled. And he communicated that he had already saved up half the money toward the replacement, you see, I'm just operating on default. I've been doing this long enough. This is just second nature. And um, <laughs> as long as I'm here, let me tie it into Sunday. I mean, I'm studying for today and I'm studying for Sunday today. It's all like a bowl of spaghetti in my mind. And uh, so... My first inclination is, well, sure, I'm going to give to that, but let me just think about how I'm going to do that because we had the challenge offering coming up. 
And of course, from the natural perspective, you would say, well, we can't do that. We can't, we can't be a blessing somewhere else because we got to take care of what we're doing. We want to get, our goal is to get to the 40% mark on this property and this building being paid off by the end of the year, right? If I don't take care of me, who's going to take care of me? If I don't take care of my dreams and visions, who's going to take care of my dreams and visions? I got to put me first, right, right, right? No, because a lot of times things are backwards in the kingdom of God. I mean, you got to sow. When you're needing to reap, you got to go look for a place to sow, right? right. And uh, so this is just second nature to me, but maybe this is not second nature to you. Maybe you're just hearing this. And so the blessing of the Lord is a two-sided blessing. I, I want to... Sure, I want to be blessed. And anybody who says they don't want to be blessed will lie about other things also. And so, sure, I want to be blessed. But I have to understand that if I'm going to walk in the blessing of the Lord, I'm not talking about some kind of mafia prosperity. I'm saying to walk in the blessing of the Lord, I just can't go around looking to be blessed. I have to be a blessing. Amen. Does that make sense? Amen. And then let me tie this into Sunday because... <laughs> And, and this is just where I live. You just have to realize. I mean, I'm just, I mean, I'm just opening my heart and telling you where I live. And so there goes $46,000 out the door because, honey, when I give my word, that's it. Gone. And so then they showed me a number this week and something like 4,700 had come in. Let's see, 46,000 out, 4,700 in. See, you don't want to meditate on that. You're, you're, it'll be like a microwave on your brain. 46000 out, $4,700 in. But let me tie this into Sunday, as long as we're here. Every time I think about it. See, now, Sue and I have been married long enough. We don't accuse each other of being crazy. Because I might just be walking through the house, and she might hear me say something like, the money's coming. Well, we know each other. We've been married long enough. We know each other. And she knows, well, something passed through his mind that might cause him some concern. And so he's making his confession. Now, you, I wouldn't suggest doing this at work in front of a bunch of sinners. Uh, you, you might have to, you know, take a restroom break and say, the money's coming, right? Or, you know, go to lunch, say, the money's coming. But in other words... And this is the way I have trained. Now this is second nature. This is the way I've trained myself that anytime anything alarming passes through my mind or, you know, sometimes I just feel something that I know is not right in my body. So I've just trained myself over the years that if there's anything that would cause me any anxiety or apprehension or I won't use the word worry because I, I think I'm past that. But I, I just, that's where I make my confession. I just open up my mouth. I say, well, I'm the blessed and healed of Almighty God. Amen. You know, we were getting ready to fly to uh, Missouri to see my uh, daughter and son-in-law. And the topic of Ebola came up. I mean, I just lifted my hand and said, what has that got to do with us? In other words, when there is any anxiety, any apprehension, any thought that might be negative, you, let me, and this is worth coming tonight and whatever you're going to give. You cannot fight thoughts with thoughts. You can only fight thoughts with spoken words. When you have a thought of worry or anxiety that comes into your mind and you try and think positive thoughts to ward those negative thoughts off, that does not work. I have tried it a million times. But when you open your mouth and you speak something that is in agreement with the Word of God, somehow that gets rid of the negative thought. Now, why that happens, I don't know. But I know it works. Amen. So you cannot combat negative thoughts with positive thoughts, but you can combat negative thoughts with a positive confession. All right, so we're talking about Abraham. We're talking about this concept of the... And here's the thing, that $46,000 out the door, $4,700 in the door, hey, this is not alarming for another reason because 
the kingdom of God operates by the laws of seed time and harvest. Of course, of course, of course. When the farmer goes out and he plants 200 acres of corn, he doesn't have his harvest right away. Right? There's a season. And then he's got to tend it. You know, he might have to irrigate it. He might have to weed it. He might have to care for it. He might have to fertilize it. So that's why coming to church once a year doesn't work. Because you, you got to water the word. You got to fertilize the word. Man, you know what I'm saying? Because you have to care for your field, right? To get the right kind of harvest that you want coming in. And so with regard to Abraham, he was given this promise. You're, you're going to be blessed, but then also you're going to be a blessing. Say it out loud. There's no point in my expecting no in my to, be blessed to be blessed without being, without being a, blessing. a blessing. And so really, and this is true even in sales. I mean, if, if you are if you're the kind of person who wants to help people find the right car, help people find the right house, you're just going to make more money than someone who just says, well, I just want my, I just want to, I mean, just put them in anything, get them out the door and let me get the commission. And the same thing is true. Let's say, let's say you're building houses or let's say you're remodeling houses. Uh, You know, you put love into your work, you put quality into your work, you do a good job, you're going to get word of mouth references over time. Now, it might not happen in 60 days. But over time, you're going to make more money if you just take care of people. If you just take care of people. You know, I had a a guy that does some work at my house, and he got injured somewhere else, and he he was not able to come a week, and I hired another outfit to come. And and so it was easy, man. It was online, and, and, uh, you know, it just seemed a little bit more professional and this and that and the other. But... You know, as soon as my guy was healed up, man, I just went back to my guy. Why? Well, because he's done a good job. He has treated me right. See, in other words, if you'll just do a good job for people, if you'll just do right by people, you're going to have some loyalty going there. So it's not just a matter of being blessed. It's a matter of being a blessing. Now, I'm not talking about giving away all your goods. I'm not saying that making money is wrong or that making a commission is wrong. Actually, what I'm saying is you'll make more commissions if you'll try and be a blessing to people and get them, get them into the desire of their heart. When we pioneered this church coming up on 31 years ago, that's, that's really the, the main word of the Lord that God gave me. And I'm standing here mulling this over in my mind. I did a whole series on one word from the Lord, and then I repeated that series once or twice, but I don't even think I've spoken on this in I don't know how many years. The main word from the Lord the Lord gave me when we pioneered this church was this. If you will just help another, enough people get what they want in life, you'll have any, everything you want in life. That was the main thing God said to me when we pioneered this church. If you will just help enough people get what they want in life, out of life, then you'll get everything you want out of life. And I'm here to testify. I'm here to testify. We had no thought of getting this far. It's just amazing what God has done. And uh, it's the discipline of our lives to be a blessing. So then he says, I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will will be blessed through you. Our youth minister, Aaron Wood in Austin, are at a minister's conference this week and uh, Austin texted me a story that I did not know. You know, I have a lot of friends in high places and so typically I know what's going on. But uh, he texted me a a short story I did not know on uh, on Richard Roberts' loss of corporate control of Oral Roberts University. And uh, I didn't know this. Whenever there's something like that going on, really, I don't want to know about it because I figure, you know, somebody's up to something. And, but you know, your heart grieves. And, uh, but anyway, so the main instigator, I didn't, I never knew the story, so I couldn't connect the dots. But the main instigator on that was dead within 18 months. A young man. Dead within 18 months. So 
we have to be very cautious on how we handle the Lord's anointed. You know, I see things going on, and uh, I, I hear about sermons, and I think, oh, gosh. And I, I, I hear about things, but I just don't get my mouth on stuff. Because, and let me tell you something else. Sue said just the other day, when Austin texted that story, Sue said, I wonder if that's one reason God has blessed us the way he has blessed us. Because when I was around my fathers of the faith, uh, the first one that I met was Finest Jennings Dake or Kenneth Hagan or T.L. Osborne or Oral Roberts or R.W. Shambach or Fred Price or any of these guys. Lester Summerall was the main guy. I, I handled them. Uh, the word I use is gingerly. I handled them carefully. You know, I would not let one thing come out of my mouth. I remember, I remember Dr. Summerall, you know, grabbing me by the shoulder, say, come on, you can tell me. Because he could tell that, you know, I didn't want, I was so cautious in what I was saying. And that's the way Abraham was. I mean, we already dealt with it about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. He, he, he lied to Pharaoh because he was worried about his beautiful wife and maybe being killed over her. He lied to Abimelech uh, because of his beautiful wife. And the question came, um, you know, why would you do this? And Pharaoh, Pharaoh, and we're talking maybe 4,000 years ago, Pharaoh had more sense than any political leader you can name anywhere in the world because as soon as disease hit his house, Pharaoh figured out this has got a spiritual root. But people just can't connect the dots today that uh, if, there, if the economy's not going, well, you know, maybe there's a reason for it. Maybe there's a spiritual reason for it. You know, in your home, if, two, if you're husband and wife and you're fighting all the time, well, maybe it's not just because, you know, one was born under the sign of uh, Taurus and one was born under the sign of Monte Carlo. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe there's more going on than that. Maybe there's a spiritual problem. You see what I'm saying? In other words, we, we have trouble connecting the dots that maybe we're, maybe we're not doers of the Word of God and now we got a problem. And so this man was a prophet. He was, he was a man of God. And it's so strange because he wasn't called till he was 75. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And Lot going with him was an interesting caveat to the story because the Lord said, leave your, fa leave your family behind. And I'm sure, Lot, I'm sure Abraham meant well. I'm sure Abraham meant well. But how, many, how much trouble do we create in our own lives through good intentions? And it was through Lot, it was through Lot that the Ammonites and the Moabites got created. And let me tell you something else too. If you study these chapters, the Lord did not speak to Abraham again until Lot left. So a lot of times we're wondering, you know, uh, we're wondering, I wonder why the Lord hadn't spoken to me in so long. Well, you just got off the phone with your drug dealer. You know, in other words, if we're not living right, we wonder how come we're not hearing from the Lord. Well, maybe there's a reason. And let me say something else about hearing from the Lord. If you ignore the written word of God, why should God give you a, a word by the Holy Spirit? Say it out loud. If I ignore the written word of God, why should God give me a word by his Spirit? And so we see, skip down to verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. You skip down in verse 8. He is now uh, east of Bethel. And it says there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And then he headed to the Negev. He went from the area called the Negev down to Egypt. When he came back from Egypt, he went back to the Negev. Chapter 13, verse 1 so Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. He still got this guy in tow. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and silver and gold. 
And you understand back then they didn't have brokerage accounts, they didn't have IRAs, they didn't have 401ks, they didn't have digits on a hard drive. And so you counted your wealth by livestock, silver, and gold. Well, we're introduced to Abraham in chapter 12, and by chapter 13, the Bible says he had become very wealthy. Now, let me ask you a question. If becoming very wealthy were wrong, why would the, why would the Bible record it in a positive light, speaking of Abraham? Why, why is it okay for Dave Ramsey to teach from the Bible on money and it's okay for rabbis to teach from the Bible on money, but people get offended at evangelical pastors teaching from the Bible on money. I mean, I'm asking you a question. I mean, because if you, if you read anything of Dave Ramsey's, a lot of it's just from the Bible. So why, why is it okay for Dave Ramsey to teach on prosperity from the Bible and it's okay for rabbis to teach on prosperity from the Bible. But, but, and, and people will go to a Dave Ramsey seminar and they'll get their nose out of joint over some preacher talking about prosperity. It doesn't make any sense at all. I don't know about you, but if I can find prosperity from any legitimate source, I'm interested. I'm not talking about a, a drug dealer or a stock market manipulator. I'm talking about from any legitimate source, I'm interested. Right? And so the Bible says that he became very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold from the Negev. He went from place to place. He was a nomad until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar to the Lord. Then Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot who was moving about with Abram also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. So the point is that a lot of this wealth was in livestock. And so when they're moving about, I don't know how much livestock they had, but they had enough livestock. Probably it was a hardship on the land. And they were together. And then on top of them being together, the Bible says the Perizzites and the Canaanites were also living in the land. And so you have a lot going on wherever Abraham and Lot are moving together, whatever vicinity they're moving in. So Abraham said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and mine. For we are brothers, is not the whole land before <coughs> you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. And if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Now, right there, we find out a lot about Abraham. We find out a lot about Abraham in this regard, that, that Abraham was not a control freak. There's a spirit loose in this land. And the spirit that's loose in this land is a controlling spirit. If you're actually a child of God and you're actually walking in covenant with God, it should not really be your heart's desire to control anybody. Amen. Now, I'm not talking about little children in your home. You've got to control them. You've got to make sure they eat when they're supposed to eat. You've got to make sure they have a bath before they go to bed. That's not controlling them. Controlling them, well, there's all kinds of control. No point in going down that road. I mean, people control people through all kinds of means and methods. And the, a spirit of control. How, how much does God control us? This is the easiest way to paint the picture. How much does God control us? Not at all. But Satan is into control, whether it is through drugs or through alcohol or through wrong women or uh, whatever it is, Satan is into control. He wants to control. God is into liberty. And the Apostle Paul actually taught that our goal should be to live a life dependent on no one. And so we, the objective of Christianity is actually to be a blessed person living under and in relationship with covenant relationship with God, dependent on no one. But then also, let me throw this in, not controlling other people.
Parker's a, a wonderful man. He's just a wonderful man. He really is just a wonderful man. And uh, he's been coming here for a few years. And, and I was just dumbfounded when he told me the story. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. He served 15 years in prison. And uh, when he got out, he started attending a church. And I don't remember what city it was in, if it was Arlington or Fort Worth. And this pastor had him cleaning his house, cleaning his toilets, cutting his grass, uh, doing all this manual labor stuff. And, uh, and then something happened over there. I'm not sure, some, some kind of scandal. And then he and his wife came in here and he told me, he said he, he walked in the doors and he, he started crying. He said he saw all the people, you know, he, he had never been in a church with so many men. He'd never been in a church that was so racially mixed. He said he stood at the back and he started crying. But he said, he, he, he said, I hate to admit it, but he said, in my heart, I just knew there had to be something wrong. And he said, so he said, I was here a few weeks and I just kept waiting for you to tell me what to do. And I, then I was here a few months and I kept wait, waiting for you to tell me what to do. And, and he said, and he said, Pastor, he said, I've been here years and you haven't told me anything to do. <laughs> Years. And I said, well, brother, we're not into that. See, it's a horrible thing to take the Bible or Christ or church to manipulate other people. But let me back up and say this. It's just a horrible thing to manipulate people. And so Lot, it was time for Lot to go. And if you came here to hear a word from the Lord, maybe you came because it's Wednesday night. God bless you. But maybe you came because you have been looking for a word from the Lord. You need an answer. Well, here it is. You're not going to make any more progress in life until you let Lot go. Amen. Amen. But notice that Abraham was so convinced that he was blessed he said, if you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Now, this is, this is, a, this is a big man. See, a little man, a little man would, would figure out where he wanted to go and then try and talk Lot into going the other way. But Lot, see, part, part of this thing of walking in covenant with God, part of this thing of walking in covenant with God financially is being convinced that God's got me covered. Yes. Amen. And I'm not planning on making a mistake, but even if I make a mistake, I'm going to come out all right because God's got my back. Yes. Amen. Amen. And I don't have to pick up every nickel walking down the road. Amen. See, I don't have to try and get every nickel out of every transaction. I don't have to try and manip I don't need to manipulate another human being. Because I'm not, my success and my prosperity is not dependent on other human beings. See, the person who's trying to manipulate the other person doesn't really have confidence in themselves. And so Abraham was a big man, and Abraham said, well, you know, you go to the right, I'll go to the left. You go to the left, I'll go to the right. He said, that's exactly what he said. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt toward Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. So uh, you've got basically a river valley running through desert. And so, of course, in the river valley that runs through desert, of course, left and right of that river is green. And if you have cows and camels and donkeys and stuff like that, well, that's the place to go. So, so Lot basically took what he thought was the best. But it wasn't his God that called him out of the land of Babylon. It wasn't, it, it wasn't his obedience that got him there. It wasn't his faith that got him there, but he still wanted the best. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Abraham was a big enough man to let that slide. All right, all right. And a few years ago, the Lord spoke to me out of the blue. 
about, I mean, it was not in regard to anything. Out of the blue, he spoke to me, and he said, be like Abraham. I said, okay, okay. And then a moment or two later, be like Abraham. Well, now he had my attention, and I said, well, in what regard, Father? And he said, always let Lot take the low road. Because that's what he did. He came off of those mountains, and he took the low road. And we know, because we've actually read further in the Bible than we are right now, that in picking that low land, low being geographical, but low also being figurative, when he took that low land in that green area, well, we just have to keep reading. We don't have to speculate. So Lot chose for himself, verse 11, the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Well, in chapter 13, he has pitched his tents toward Sodom. We get over a few chapters. He's not toward Sodom. He's in Sodom. And that's, that's really a huge issue. You know, fellowship is a big thing. Who we hang with. Did you know, did you know that the average income in America can be, can be calculated? The average person in America, their income can be calculated by averaging the salaries of their top five friends. And I'm sure that it's not just salary. Whether people drink or not is probably very dependent on who they hang with. Whether people smoke or not is probably very dependent on who they hang with. Uh, whether people do recreational drug use is probably very dependent on who they hang with. But let me tell you what, your income is dependent on who you hang with. So he was toward Sodom. The Lord said to Abram after Lot parted from him. Say it out loud. The Lord did not speak to Abraham a second time until he had parted company with Lot. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, lift up your eyes from where you are. And that's one of my favorite phrases in the entirety of the word of God. It doesn't matter where you are tonight, it doesn't, you could be here tonight, you could be divorced, you could be bankrupt, you could be uh, undone, you, you could have come through a bankruptcy and your net worth could be zero, you could be sitting here tonight and your net worth be under zero. It doesn't matter where you are because this is the God we serve. We serve the God who says, lift up your eyes from where you are. And so this God that we serve is not a God of staying where you're at. This God that we serve is a God of going to another level. And think about it. He found this man in Ur of the Chaldees in modern day Babylon. He could have left him there, but he had a plan. And the plan obviously wasn't to, to mess him up or to uh, leave him where he was. The plan was to prosper him and to give him a son. And then he became very wealthy in the process. Lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south and east and west. And hopefully that's what happens every time you come into these doors. Hopefully that's what happens every Sunday morning. You come into these doors. And that's why we are unapologetic about challenging you. Church shouldn't be where we comfort you and your loserdom. Church ought to be where we say, lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south and east and west because God's got more for you. You think, you think you've done a ride? No, no, God's got more for you. And then whether we're, that works, man, whether we're at the top or the bottom or the middle, lift up your eyes from where you are. And look, see, that's what happens when you, when you attend a church that's a faith church. We, we get you to look, yeah. right? Yeah. Look. You look at the promises of the word. You look at what God has to say. And look, north and south, east and west, all the land that you... Now, if land were bad to own, why would he talk like this? All the land that you see I will give to you, 
When I heard uh, Dr. Yonggi Cho preach from this passage, he said if, if he were Abraham, he'd wish to God it was in the future and he had a helicopter because God said, all, all the land that you see, I will give you. Well, I got to get up higher. All the land that you will see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. Of course, atheists hate this, but you know, God has this strange idea. You know, if you send your little Johnny to a public school, they're going to teach him how horrible, how horrible Christopher Columbus was, and how horrible Cortez was, and how, because, you know, this, this was the, the, the land of the Indians. Well, I'll tell you who was here before the Indians. God. And he has the strangest idea that since he created the earth, he can just give the dirt to whomever he chooses. And the Bible, this same Bible, talks about the wealth of the wicked being stored up for the righteous. See, if you let that world out there put you on a, under a guilt complex, you're going to have trouble pulling ahead in life. Yeah. Say it out loud. Somebody's going to get blessed. Gonna get blessed. And, it and it may as well be me. I mean, right? Tomorrow, Thursday, somebody's going to get blessed. Yeah. Right? Somebody's going to make the sale. Somebody's going to have the closing. Somebody's going to buy low and sell high. It may as well be me. Amen. Amen. He says, I'm giving it to you. So Abram moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron where he built an altar to the Lord. And of course, every time we see that, built an altar to the Lord, he was worshiping God. He was a worshiper of God. And God blessed him. Amen. 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 Well, I'm out of time. I hope you enjoyed it this evening. Amen. Say it out loud. I'm going to lift up my eyes from where I am because God has got more for me. Amen. 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 Amen.